Hello, welcome to a recap of today's open source hangout. In this session, we worked on the Western Friend website. The source code is available on github.com slash westernfriend and it's in the westernfriend.org repository. It's the uh, source code of the Western Friend website we can see here uh, running locally and here's the feature we were working on today in this deep archive we have issues of this Western friend magazine Let me reload this real quick going back to 1929 when it was called the friends bulletin we've been archiving issues from 1929 to 2008. Uh, it was a bulk project uh, in partnership with the Internet Archive. And what they do is we send them boxes of these print documents and they scan them. It looks like there's some issues right now. It's not rendering. And they send us back a CSV of the data um, from the scan result. This uh, includes kind of articles that appear in the PDF and the page numbers, as far as I recall, and the author names. That or we are assembling this. Uh, they might just include the uh, identifiers, and I think we maybe actually now they come to. Now that I remember is the um, processes they send us back the uh, archive ar identifiers for each of the issues and we generate data to populate the table of contents and in turn uh, we can then embed using the identifier we can embed this little interactive PDF viewer and browser here. Thing moment clicker center it's a nice place. And we have this table of contents that when you click an article, it will turn to that page. It's a bit slow. Nonetheless, it uh, should work. We should see the article coming up here shortly. Um, there was a bug today that was reported that when we added uh, the one of the newer issues from 2006, uh, loaded in the data and the table of contents didn't render. It was just a blank screen, uh, blank s section of the page, sorry. And uh, turned out there was an underlying bug in the back end and I've fixed that along with a few other changes. So I'll just really quickly recap the changes that we did today. Um, I kind of, it's been a little bit since I've been developing this project, so I lumped a few um, maintenance tasks in with the core changes. That's not necessarily a good practice, but as a uh, solo developer on a small open source project uh, for a nonprofit, I'm kind of just trying to get things improved and not worrying too much about practicalities that would normally come out of peer review. So I've got some dependency updates. We're using pre -com uh, pre-commit here to help us keep our code clean, linting it and, and uh, sorting things and doing a few other, uh, we're upgrading our syntax to use the latest features from uh, Python and Django. That's all done. Every time I commit, it just runs checks on the files that I'm editing to make sure I'm following best practices. There's been a recurring bug in our, our unit tests where we have to generate fake data and there's been collisions. This is a unique field on the user model. The email should be unique. One, uh, only one user assigned to each email. So I needed to make a small change. I can't just generate an email. I have to ensure that it's unique because th this will generate the same email. If you generate like 200 users or so, there's some likelihood of uh, there being a collision. It's very low, maybe 1% of the time, but it's been a recurring bug. So here we use a sequence number that guarantees uniqueness. And we just 
needed an email domain there. Yeah, so that was it. Uh, this is the first time I've set up my development environment on this new computer, and I realized that I had inadvertently deleted a um, command line command, uh, <laughs> CLI command that we are using here to scaffold the development environment. So I just re uh, I created an app called CLI and where we can define using management commands. Uh, and I restored a management command, and I'm maybe going to write tests for it, but not today. Uh, I restored this uh, scaffold initial content command. It's uh, basically setting up an initial development environment with all the base pages that we have, site structure, so that we can start working with a you know ready to roll site. And I didn't write this code today. It's just old code that I had accidentally deleted when I was cleaning up some old migration code. And here I just added that to our site settings. The core change here was essentially relating to the archive issue, archive article model. And archive issue are these older issues that date back to uh, 1929. They have an issue that consists of articles. Those articles have page numbers. And there's two types of page numbers here. Sometimes I'll put the uh, internet archive, but uh, I'll try to um, explain this briefly. We have what's called a table of contents page number, and that's the page number you would see that we render here in the table of contents, and that you would kind of see when browsing uh, the article, the issue, you'll see it here. Here's page number three, and uh, this one happens to correspond with another field called the uh, PDF page model number, which the PDF page always starts from the cover, or from the first page of the PDF. It doesn't matter if it's a cover or not. It's page one, page two, and page three. And now this one happens, as I mentioned, to match. But there were uh, other examples that didn't match up. I think if I go back to the 80s, it was, and let's double check, but there was a period of time where they were um, publishing volumes and issues. And so this one, see, it starts at page 42 in the table of contents because we're in a, a page 42 of volume number 50. I don't know. So that is an example of how the PDF and the table of contents would differ. Uh, the PDF, this is page one, and this is page two. But in the print and uh, table of contents here, uh, it starts at page 42. All right, so that's just a bit of background on why we have these two fields. And the, uh, I'll point out the Internet Archive also is aware of this issue, of course, being archivists. And they have a process in place to correctly display the page number as you would see it in the document. <laughs> So it's just less confusing for humans, I guess. You know, we're saying page 43, and here I'm basically there. There we go. I'm at fo page 43 now. Interesting, interesting it is. So we have these two fields, table of contents page number and PDF page number, for the reason just uh, illustrated. And they were both optional, nullable. And so I just, to prevent us from omitting those by accident, which was the problem here, that when we added the new archive issue, uh, we had omitted the PDF page number. Now they're required, so we can't really do that. They default to one, so at least they'll have a value there. It's a positive integer. Uh, so you'll have to set that value, otherwise you will, um, it'll just link to the front page. So that's I updated the model, and then while I was here, I did a couple of other things. I, if we don't add any um, articles in an archive issue, it won't display a table of contents. It doesn't make sense to do that. So that was just a small improvement I made while here. And these are kind of just um, cleaning that, cleaning up the code a little bit, changing the indentation, and removing some um, conditionals. Where now that the uh, page numbers are required, we don't have to check that they're they're there. They'll always be there. One other thing I changed is um, when you click on one, it, it can be kind of confusing I, if I, I don't realize something happened. I, I see this flash down here, 
that it's like changing the page number. It's not really quite working, but I have to kind of scroll down to see what happened. Buttons aren't working, thank you very much. The arch in our archive is having some troubles in the background. <laughs> I'm really worried about that initiative. Uh, I think they might be having a lot of server load. Uh, they're taking on quite a lot of uh, content and they're also in legal battles uh, with major publishers due to some uh, decision basically during COVID to uh, allow anybody to borrow um, copyrighted, copyrighted materials in general, I think the Inner Archive isn't really, um, is kind of putting itself at risk of uh, mass copyright violation through not only the Wayback Machine, scanning and archiving, um, just uh, the, inter the whole internet, which is a great initiative, an important initiative, but also things like their lending library, and they're just allowing arbitrary content to be uploaded with very little, from what I can tell, in the way of moderation not only for um, copyright, but also of like the types of content people are uploading. I just think they're at really big jeopardy, being a nonprofit organization even. Uh, they're risking the whole initiative by flouting copyright law. I'm a free culture advocate, uh, but I've taken a lot of time to sort of understand, understand how intellectual property laws work and how to uh, allow the things I create to be more freely um, shared and modified. Uh, I really value services like the Inner Archive. So that's a big uh, aside. And I don't know what the, the delays here are relating to copyright issues, but uh, more probably infrastructure problems, uh, which the infrastructure is you know, a massive cost as well, I'm sure. So the fix is basically, <laughs> instead of being a little bit confused, I clicked here, I see now at the bottom of the screen a flash, and it took me to the page. Well, here I've got a test page that essentially it'll now take me it'll scroll there so even if I these are all page one it's going to go there but it scrolls down to the uh, viewer it's a bit uh, take me a bit far here but it's not perfect I guess but there it is you'll go to the thing you might have to scroll up just a little bit so to change that I just uh, grab a reference to the uh, PDF viewer and um, setting the attribute to the new source was already there and that means that it's going to load in the particular page number here. So we'll load that in and then scroll into view. That was about it. Here is a uh, dependency update. And, and that, that was the main change though to this file here to control the display of the table of contents and scroll the PDF reader into view when you click the button, as well as changing the field uh, validation. Okay, this has been another open source live code hangout. I'm going to start transitioning this um, channel into more creative uh, mode rather than focusing exclusively on open source stuff. I'll be creating some music and uh, maybe other types of media, but mainly music, and sharing those in uh, free uh, culture websites like the Free Music Archive and SoundCloud. So I won't be focusing so exclusively on software development, but I don't want to manage multiple um, channels as that's a bit time consuming. So I hope you are uh, enjoying the open source uh, work and maybe we'll like to take a look into some uh, creative uh, music activities. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. Have a great day, and I hope you're doing well.